Okay. You ready to begin? Okay, this is Jerry Schwinn, uh, and this interview took place on October 19, 2012. Uh, Jerry, uh, I know you moved to Washington in 1965, but can you tell us what, you, what your life was like before that, and especially what experiences did you have in your early life that attuned you to social justice and activism? Um, well, just a sort of quick overview. I graduated from college in 1959, Schenectady, mm -hmm. New York, Union College, went off to graduate school at Indiana University, Bloomington, Indiana, and through college had never done anything political and probably carried fairly typical Baltimore black, white, racist kinds of attitudes, right? Uh, got sort of challenged a little bit at Union because there were black students, which I had never had any contact with. Mm -hmm. uh, and at uh, Bloomington, which would have been, I was there 59 through 62, mm -hmm. uh, I met some people who were very political. Uh, I, there was somebody uh, in New York, I mean somebody in uh, Bloomington from New York whose name was Dick Roman. Haven't, thought of that name for decades, uh, who came out of the Young People Socialist League, YPSL. And this, this was the early years of the Kennedy administration, so there was a, f there was a fair amount of activity around anti-nuclear war testing, the Student Peace Union, which was a fairly uh, significant group in the early 60s, I guess. Um, and so the, the people I met at, at uh, Bloomington, I, I actually came to Washington once from Bloomington for one of the demonstrations at the White House of putting an end to nuclear testing. Um, anyway, my graduate program wasn't making great advances by 1962, so I took a year off. I thought a year off uh, and taught. I, I taught at Hampton Institute in uh, Hampton, Virginia. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's now Hampton University. Uh, very interesting place, a very good year. And again, I, I was trying to finish up a master's thesis that got totally rejected, as I, as, I, as I knew by my favorite professor who said, how could anybody have suggested this as a topic? So that sort of eased the way. So I, I signed up and went off to the Peace Corps. I figured I needed a break. I wasn't going to make any progress teaching in college if I didn't have a master's degree. So I, got, I applied, got accepted to the Peace Corps, and went off to Nigeria for two years, um, 63 to 65. And uh, after Peace Corps, or at the, at, near the end of Peace Corps, I was looking for some way to wrap up the, the master's degree. There was a program based in Washington uh, that allowed one to teach in the schools and get a master's degree by taking some course, finish a master's degree by taking coursework at Howard. It's called the Cardozo Project in Urban Teaching. Mm -hmm. so, I taught, so I taught at Cardozo that first year, took courses, and that was enough coursework to wrap up the masters. Um, through those first couple years, I, I began to make some contact with uh, other people who had been in overseas volunteer service organizations. There were people mostly around New York City who were beginning to try to create a group that uh, w would gather together people who had overseas third world experience to, to use that as a platform to talk about what was wrong with what we were doing in Vietnam. Uh, so this would have been 65? Th this would have been, well, 66, 7, 66, 67 probably. After the war started. Uh, oh yeah, after the war yeah. started. And in fact, I think very, the, the first year, I think there was a fairly major uh, anti-war demonstration in probably 65. There were two. Uh, there was one in April at the White House and there was another one in October. Paul Potter spoke at the first one, Carl Oldesby spoke at the second one. Yeah, and I went, I went, yeah. I went to those and that was probably, probably some, of the, some of the motivation for the people at, in New York to pull together a group. I, I uh, don't remember quite how we linked up or made contact, but I, I met John McAuliffe who was, who was why was he here in Washington? That I don't remember. Uh, but he and I started an effort to bring together returned overseas volunteers uh, who were living in the Washington area. And, and we had a couple really very large meetings. And another name from the past, we, we were able to get space to have the meetings at George Washington University through Mal Davis. Uh, Mal Davis was the on-site requester of the space for us. He was the and, Yeah. And so, um, we, after some weeks or months and, and 
recruiting, urging people to come to the, the demonstrations. We created a chapter and then they're eventually developed into a national group for a few years, the Committee on Return Volunteers. And, and one characteristic of that was that it was not just Peace Corps people, it was people who had served in IVS, International Voluntary Service, a lot of whom had served in uh, Vietnam. In fact, that may have been their only, or maybe other countries in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh, and then, then various church groups had sent volunteers to third world countries. So it was sort of a, an amalgam of people with different third world experiences. Um, what other things were going on? I guess, uh, as I said, I taught at Cardozo for two years. I, I lived a block from the high school. Uh, Tell not us a, a little bit what Cardozo was like in 1964 or five. Well, th there was a fairly sizable number of people who were um, in the program, a dozen or 15 or 20 people. Um, we taught just half time, so I think each of us had two classes at Cardozo. I was teaching English. Uh, English and social studies were the courses that people were teaching, I think. Uh, and then we had had seminars with people from Howard University that constituted getting graduate credit. Uh, and uh, I, it was it was all black at that point. I, I think now it has a very heavy Hispanic uh, student population. I don't know what the mix is, but but it was only black students to speak of in, in the mid '60s. Um, it was a fine school. There were there were other um, well, there was there was a teacher who was already there who I think had been in Peace Corps the first two years. Uh, might be somebody to talk about talk with about the activities. Roberta Rabinoff was was her name. Uh, she's still in town. Still lives in the city. Um, but it was a good place to teach. I mean, it was very. I, I don't know. There weren't any tensions. You know. I mean. The, well. I guess the year after I stopped teaching there, or two years after I stopped teaching there, an assistant principal was killed in the school with, by a student with a gun. Uh, there, there, but there wasn't anything like, I mean, maybe I was oblivious, but it seemed a very low-key kind of place. Uh, and uh, there was a, I think that was still in the days of tracking, when they had, uh, uh, students were put in classes on the basis of either their previous record or their test scores or whatever. So there was a there was a group in the A track that isn't probably what it was called, uh, and uh, so they got very good instruction. And um, there was there was I think also still vocational courses taught at uh, taught at Cardozo. Uh, don't quite remember what they would have been, but because there were there were still operating vocational high schools in the city, uh, Bell and Armstrong, and anyway, uh, the other thing that that was also the the 60s was the beginning of the period of some movement towards home rule. Uh, Johnson had appointed or had established the uh, an appointed city council. Some interesting local people got got appointed to that. Uh, and then I guess it was probably under Nixon. I'm not sure where, when exactly it, it turned into an elected uh, city council. 70, Prior to the city council. 78 or 79. Oh, that late? Yeah, it was oh, late. Okay. Because uh, we elected the first, the first mayor, elected mayor was Marion Barry. That was 78. No, it would have been Walter. No, Walter. Oh, Walter was didn't appointed. get. He, he I thought he ran and got elected maybe, once. Maybe he did. He might be right. Yeah, right. yeah. But he was, yeah, he was at first. Um, Appointed, maybe, yeah, and then, then ran one okay, term, so and it maybe was defeated sentence. when he ran for re-election or not. Okay, okay. Local history. Well, there was an elected school board uh, before that, uh, which created local political activity, and and probably, in my recollection, the most prominent person uh, would have been Julius Hobson, who was not on the board, who was uh, who took the city and the school system to court over. Uh, equal resource, the distribution of resources equally across all the schools. It was apparently not done that way. Um, so there was a lot of activity around that area. Um, I, I, so I guess the, I, I continued to be involved with anti-war activity through the Committee of Return Volunteers, the chapter here, and, and, there, were, and there were a couple national meetings. Um, I. The year after uh, I, I taught at Cardozo for two years, the, the third year I was in the city, I, I got a job with an anti-poverty program that was based in Anacostia, and the war it, on poverty? yeah, the war on poverty. 
uh, and it was it was running basic education and and maybe mostly basic education and and basic skills job preparation kinds of things didn't have very much of an actual job focus but uh, it was and, teaching. Yeah, well, I was I was managing the teaching staff for what that was worth. Uh, it wasn't the most effective of programs. I'm not sure where people went from from that. Um, and then uh, I I applied and got a job with the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. They had decided that uh, growing out of all the civil rights activities in the '60s, they needed to sort of find ways to focus on the or to look at what was going on in the white community to try to deal with racism. Uh, and interestingly, the, one of the people who had been Peace Corps staff in Nigeria was running the Washington was running one of the the Civil Rights Commission offices. He had been the lone. U.S. Civil Rights Commission representative in the South for for a few years in the mid '60s, and then came to Washington and ran an office, and and I think relocated to New. Anyway, uh, so I did that for about a year or so. That was would have been like '67, early '68, yeah. and um, probably all through that period. I mean, there was, as you said, there was an April and an October demonstration in '65. There were probably two demonstrations every year through through the '60s and into the into the '70s. Yeah. Um, and of course, there was a lot of activity around the 1968 uh, primary campaign, and then the convention, obviously, the convention in Chicago. And, and, and we we mounted a pretty sizable group of people who who spent the convention week in the park, Lincoln Park, yeah, Lincoln park. across from the host hotel. Um, I want to go backward a little, come yeah. back to this, but. So the so you actually when you came to Washington then you were already quite involved in what would have to be called in some aspects left wing anti-racial work anti you know anti racist work yeah I mean, although it wasn't probably formerly that it was teaching in African American schools and civil well Hampton I mean, Hampton Virginia in yeah. in Hampton, uh, 1962 63 was was segregated uh, yeah. and uh, I uh, w one of those one of those embarrassing moments. That, um, I had gone, I had arranged for a group of students at, at Hampton to go to see a, a program at William and Mary uh, in, William and Mary is in the, Williamsburg, Williamsburg. Didn't you go there? I, I went to William and Mary. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I think I remember it was the author of Tobacco Road. Called uh, Erskine called. called anyway, we went. It was a great. It was a great event, and uh, we had a we had a college uh, car and driver, and so there were half a dozen of us and whatever. And and coming back, we wanted to stop to get something to eat or or use the bathroom or something. And of course, the place was segregated. And I I volunteered to go in and get stuff for people, and the black driver said, "No, we don't do that." Why? Well, you don't you don't participate and support, okay. you know, blatantly say, you know, I was, you know, sort of taken aback, but you know, very appropriate response and telling for someone who hadn't lived in the South, right? right. This was, uh, this was Virginia in the late '60s, yeah, yeah. Mid, yeah. You know, middle '60s, I guess, right? Uh, well, no, this would have been this would have been '62, '63. Okay, so it was so early. it was really early. Yeah. There were some student demonstrations in the town that I that I that I joined and participated in. I mean, the, the lunch counters and the, everything was segregated in Hampton at that mm -hmm. at that point. Um, and and then uh, for one of the motivating factors for going into the Peace Corps, I, I was in Hampton uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. and and Hampton almost sinks and the the. What's the phrase for that area, Hampton, Norfolk, the Hampton, Hampton Roads, Roads area? Yes. Uh, almost sunk, sinks into the ocean because of the amount of military bases and things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, nonstop, planes taking on and off. You could hear them all day and all night long. And I said, that's not a good place to be. So I figured I'd go off somewhere where, where uh, there was less chance of being involved in a nuclear war. And in the early 60s, uh, Asia was a disaster. I mean, you know, India, India was on the way to, you know, being a basket case if it wasn't already, and there wasn't anything else very promising in Asia at that point, oddly. Uh, Latin America was very dismal because every country was run by a dictator. 
whereas Africa was just coming out of the colonial period, first years of independence, you know, there was a lot of, so anyway, that, I mean, the, the, the reversal of that situation in the 30, 40 years since is striking. I mean, Africa is basically the basket case, and yeah. Asia is it's very prosperous, good. and there's been really significant progress in Latin, most of Latin America. Yeah, so if you look now and 40 years from now, if, ago, anyway, uh, so I got two years in Nigeria. That was a very good experience. I taught in a secondary about school. That. Like, what was what was the best, the best stuff about being in the Peace Corps in Nigeria? Was well, um, I mean, obviously to be in a place that was so different, uh, and it was a new secondary school. So when I got there in '63, uh, there were only two classes of students, and then by the time I left, which I guess I came at the, near the end of the school year. Uh, there were, they had already gotten to the, the five years, five years of secondary school, and then there's the sixth forum. And so each year the school added another class, and so they added buildings. And, and uh, it's, uh, of course, nearly most of the schools in Nigeria at that point were, were uh, religious schools. The one I was in was run by Irish fathers uh, with Nigerian staff. And, um, I started out living in a room with the, with the principal, the Irish father, and across the campus was this building that had six, six rooms, or there were, there, were two, uh, there were two units that had two rooms, a kitchen, and, oh no, the kitchens were always outside, but anyway, a, a living room, bedroom, and then, and then two others that, that was not very full, it only had two Nigerian teachers in it, so I said, well, can I move across there? And, there was a little hesitation, I mean, move from the father's house to the house where the Nigerian teachers were. The father was a little slow to say yes, but he said yes. Uh, and then before I left, um, the father went and built another house, like the house that he lived in for, for me. So I moved into a three-room a three house the last six months or so that I was there. And then because you know, the, the notion was that they would continue to, to expand and they'd have more senior, more degree teachers. The Nigerians had got, the Nigerian teachers generally had, had just a couple years of, maybe even just had secondary, uh, maybe through fifth form or sixth form. Uh, and it was a pretty British curriculum. Uh, John Brown School Days was on the curriculum. Uh, I, I was, I was, there was a fairly, uh, there was a growing amount, and it probably had been around for a number of years, but there was a growing amount of Nigerian literature, uh, a very prominent Nigerian novelist who, who, wrote, uh, who wrote adult and non-adult books, so we were able to bring some of that into the, into the classroom. The interesting thing, there was a series of books that a British publisher had put out which, which focused on, on middle school, high school age kids in different countries. And so it was Athos of Greece or somebody of somewhere else. Somebody, and, and these were picture books with a story so that there were, the photographs were actually taken in the country where the story is being told by, and the focus of the story was the kids who were in the picture. So there was one called Okolo, Boy of Nigeria. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I got it, I, we read it, uh, read through the book in class. And for a few weeks, every kid in the school changed his name to Okolo. <laughs> you know, just, which was, some, but the same thing happened when they, we read John Brown's School Days. Everybody changed their name, you know, just that, that identification. Maybe it wasn't John Brown's School Days, was it? The, the, the famous British children's series. Anyway, so I have a son who's named Okolo. That's sort of the right. source of that, right. of that naming. Uh, and um, so Peace Corps two years, teaching Washington, teaching in Washington for two years, and a couple other jobs in the anti-poverty, world on poverty thing. And then uh, I left the Civil Rights Commission job because I had got elected or asked to be the director of, to run the, the New York office of the Committee of Return Volunteers. CRD. Yeah, and so that involved a fair amount of traveling and talking and trying to get groups going in other parts of the country. And then each time there was a demonstration, trying to get as large a large a contingent of us to be a presence at the rallies. Well, maybe at this the is time now to talk about um, uh, once you, so well, you were a former, really, of CIV. You were an initiator of C CRV with other people, and you were the director. This is probably the time to talk about the great CRV takeover, isn't it? Uh, 
Um, while I was, I guess, yeah, while I was uh, the officer, well, I don't remember what the title was, president, uh, I got invited with three other people to go on a trip to North Vietnam. There was a steady stream of American anti-war people invited to go to sort of learn about the other side and to, to be able to be spokespeople for not everything is what the U.S. government says about what's, what's going on and what's happening. Uh, and uh, remind me of your question again. The, I lost that. Um, trip to Vietnam. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I was invited to go, and and it was like I, I know probably a four week trip. Um, what year is this? You don't remember? Sixty seven, maybe. It probably was sixty nine, sixty eight. Sixty eight. Okay. Sixty seven, sixty eight, sixty eight, sixty nine. Oh, right, okay. right, right, right around there. Uh, I think it was probably after all the sixty eight demonstrations. That's something I need to find in my journals if I late can 60s. still find them. Yeah, late late sixties, and so I was on my way back from from the from Vietnam. Uh, I, I flew back. I I had gone with Charlotte Bunch, Charlotte Bunch Week, and so we flew from New York to Paris to Athens to Colombo, uh, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Ceylon still at that point. And then to Vientiane, and we were supposed to get a Vietnamese flight from Vientiane to Hanoi. And apparently, you had to be there for a while for the Americans to find out who you were and, and stuff. So we had a whole week in Vientiane waiting to get in. That's Laos. And, Laos, yeah. Vientiane, yeah. Um, and then um, coming back, I continued the flight in the other way uh, with stops in. in uh, Thailand, Hong Kong, uh, the Philippines. I knew some people from Peace Corps stuff in the Philippines, and then Tokyo, and, and was able to sort of report on the trip to a large Japanese meeting with an American translator and stuff. And so while I was in the Philippines, that's when the takeover of the Peace Corps building happened, because that was also the point at which the that had happened in response to the to the invasion of Cambodia. So that would benchmark that year. Okay, so Seven. the invasion of Cambodia was in 1970. That was yeah. May 1970. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, must, so I, must have, I must have been in the Peace Corps office, seven, six, uh, the Committee of Return Volunteers office, 69, 70, and then went to, uh, uh, went to Vietnam then. Yeah, Vietnam then. And so all I was able to do was send a telegram <laughs> of congratulations. Tell us uh, about the, tell us about, um, the takeover, though. I mean, you weren't there, but you know the story. Uh, the CRV took over the Peace Corps office. Right, right. And and I think probably, um, and, and it, the building at the time was right on the corner across from Lafayette Square. So, so if you look out the, the White House. If you look out the windows, you could see the White House. And uh, obviously, you should you should talk to to uh, Joe Stork, who was who was key, who's still around here, who was one of the key people. Uh, someone else who's no longer in this area, but was in was here for a long time, Elaine Fuller. Uh, and what was the what was the underground newspaper that preceded the city paper? Quicksilver Times. I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. She she and they had offices on Thomas Circle before some of the old house. Anyway, she she wrote for that for a while, and so she was here then, and was I know one of the people. I, I think the the the. The Peace Corps handled that with kid gloves, and they were they ended up being there a pretty long time, and and I think there was there was a negotiated settlement that they left after a certain point, and there were, I'm pretty sure there were never any charges or uh, well, any arrests. From that demonstration, you were here then. I was here, and I, what I remember from that demonstration is that you said that the the Peace Corps building had a great view of the White House. From the White House, their view. The Peace Corps building with an enormous banner that covered half the building. That said uh, NLF flag. Yeah, well, an NLF, NLF flag. So when the <laughs> president uh, or anybody from the White House looked out, that's what they saw. Now, can you tell me what that what, what the message said? It was the NLF flag and something else. Uh, yeah. Maybe bring the boys home or get out. I, I don't remember. But well, one of the things quite pro pronounced. Yeah, one of the things that the Committee of Return Volunteers did, in, in addition to trying to. Uh, uh, build chapters and get people to do local anti-war activities and participate in national demonstrations was that for, I don't know, maybe four or five issues, we published a magazine called One, Two, Three, Many, 
after the Che Guevara one, two, three, many revolutions. And I suspect that there's good coverage in one of those issues of the demonstration. And I vaguely remember there was probably a photograph of, I'm sure there would have been a photograph. Uh, and again, I have those somewhere in the box. You couldn't uh, miss that banner. Yeah. Let's, let's cut right there really quickly. An incident, but you don't remember the context. Right. If, if you, if the, I was on a train with, with Tom Hayden once. What? I was on a train going somewhere with Tom Hayden oh, once. <laughs> that could have been in Vietnam. <laughs> we, we are ready? all set here. Yes, if you'd okay. like to continue. Um, okay, so back to uh, CRV. And, uh, well, uh, through the, the Yipsil connection in Bloomington, I went to Port Huron with, uh, with uh, Dick Roman. And, and Dick Roman and Yipso and probably me at the time, though I was very uncomfortable with it, was sort of the right wing of what was going on at, at Yipso because the Yipso were the, were the rather rigid anti-communist mm -hmm. people. And uh, one of the things, I guess one of the things I had done, I, I just hadn't remembered this for a long time, one of the things I did while I was in Bloomington for a period, uh, maybe on the verge of not continuing, but, but I, went, I went to New York and spent a time spent a time at the SDS office with who was the first the SOC Democratic Socialists uh, no no S, uh, Students S for Democratic Society oh, SDS, SDS. Uh, Al Haber oh, hey. was was the was the head of uh, was the office person and uh, there was someone fairly fairly prominent in left liberal activities who was the president at Sarah Lawrence. And they were looking, he was looking to have an assistant, and, and somehow he had contacted Al Haber at SDS to see it. So I got identified as somebody. So uh, that never worked out, but I spent some time working at the SDS office in New York. And there were a couple people in a, some kind of spin off group from the old CP days, uh, two, two people my age, two guys my age were so knowledgeable about Vietnam. It was just amazing. I mean, they knew the whole history of the French involvement. Anyways, so I don't know where that goes, but that's just something I might be able to flesh out and, and remember. So back to the late 60s, yeah. back to being in the, in the uh, Washington office, the New York office of the Committee of Return Volunteers, I got invited to go on this trip with the three other people, Frank Joyce, Charlotte Bunch Weeks, and and a Hispanic uh, woman named Elizabeth Sutherland. Elizabeth Sutherland Martinez, who, right. Who's now named, who's, who now goes by the name Batisha Martinez. She does, okay. Yeah, anyway. Uh, and when we came back, uh, that would have been spring, summer, I guess, of 70, 71. Um, I was expelled from, from the post and from the office by, uh, by all the women who were New York members of CRV because they thought it was a very... Uh, uh, chauvinist thing for the head of the organization, a male, to, to have gone to represent the organization rather than someone, a, a woman, yeah. and there were some in the New York group who had been very active doing anti-Vietnam stuff, right? So they took over the office. I lost, I lost my post and, and, and hung out in New York for about a month and then came back, came back here. Uh, so... Well, it was almost uh, as crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not... not inappropriate criticism, right? But it wasn't anything that had ever come up before right. the trip. Uh, and, and again, it was sort of the way the movement operated, right? It was right. At, the hot, at the hot top level of, yeah. of who knows who and who goes to meetings across, right. yeah, anyway. That's right. That's right. Uh, one other thing that, I'm, that I'm, I'm remembering, and this would predate being in, in New York with the, with the CRV office, but this would have been 68, the riot, the riot after King's assassination, yes. and, uh, and the rioting started here. I mean, it was, the rioting happened here in Washington. It sort of started in, the, right. in the day. And, and, uh, Where you were could, you then? You, you were back in D.C.? I was here in D.C. I was still in D.C. I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't left. Uh, so did you still live near Cardoza? Or well, you? I probably was living on Q Street, 15 or 9 Q Street at, that, at one point. Uh, I really need to sort of put the, the years down and try to fit this together. But anyway, there were, there were some of us, uh, somebody named Paul Cowan, uh, who was here, uh, and he, 
I'm not quite sure why he was in Washington. He left when he left Washington. He started writing very regularly for the Village, Village Voice. Voice. Yes. And then he died very young. He died of cancer in the eighties, I think. Yeah. Like that right yeah. Now. But uh, he was around. He was. He was also a CRU person. Yes. Because even in Ecuador. Yes, with right. his wife. Yeah. And his who, who became a rabbi, yeah. Rachel Cowan. One of the Cowans. There were several Cowan girls. It was Rachel and. Well, seven right. Which yeah. Uh, well, anyway, I know uh, I know Paul and I. I don't know that John McAuliffe would have been here. He probably wasn't here at that point. But there were there were a group of maybe a half a dozen of us who went into the Peace Corps office, uh, insisted on seeing the the director, who at the time was Vaughn, Paul Vaughn. Uh, I'm not sure, but Vaughn. He was he was the the person who succeeded Shriver. Yeah. Um, and our message, our quote demand, was that there are so many problems here at home that, that Vaughn should call on the Peace Corps uh, volunteers coming back and working in the United States. <laughs> Not th that didn't happen, obviously, uh, but it was a good exchange uh, for what that was worth. And um, Vista was also, Vista did do that. Came, well, yeah, I don't know. Vista must have been in existence at that point by 68. I think it was, yeah. Because it was an early creation yeah. of the war on poverty. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And maybe that was the mechanism. I yeah. mean, you, could, yeah. you had a mechanism and you could absorb the people. Right. Uh, but that it was sort of hypocritical to be doing good deeds overseas when so much needed to be done here. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, a little vignette from, from yeah. that period. Um, and then after after my my uh, tour was ended prematurely, <laughs> and I came back I came back to uh, Washington. Uh, I guess the next thing I got involved in the community bookshop, and uh, there, History. well before that, uh, they were in a basement on of all places K Street between uh, twenty. Second and twenty third, or twenty first and probably twenty first and twenty second, in in a townhouse. It's not, I mean not, there are no more townhouses yeah. in that block anymore. Uh, and I, the the person who started that and was involved for a long time, I can't can't bring up his name. But David Marcuse. Yeah, David Marcuse. Mm -hmm. And um, it had it had a fair amount of support and maybe fi some financial support from a number of old Washington CP people. Yeah. That's where I met the people who right. Garrett Park, right. and and it was doing well, and so it moved very soon from a basement in, on K Street in a townhouse to to uh, uh, the first floor of a townhouse on P Street, uh, and I guess I was involved with that, working pretty much full time for a, a couple years, uh, and. That was about the about the time uh, that Okola was born, and and his mother was finishing up a doctorate degree. So it was sort of convenient that I wasn't fully engaged with employment and had time while she was fully engaged in getting a getting a dissertation. Um, though it, it, that would have been in the in the early to mid seventies. Yeah, Okola was born in nineteen seventy one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Uh, so you've been working with CRV, and you've been at involved at the community bookstore. Yeah, and after that, I sort of became, I, I did spend some time, uh, we, his, you helped me remember, or the list helped me remember his name, Fred Branfman, right. uh, who interestingly, um, not sure how he was there, probably teaching, I guess, but Fred Branfman was in, in Laos. He was in Laos. And in Vientiane, Vientiane, we were there at the, I mean, our week waiting to get a flight to Hanoi, we met him, and there were there were a couple other American uh, IVS people. I don't think he was IVS, but we met some IVS people. That would have been Don Luce, probably, and Sally Dunson, mm -hmm. those people. There's a bunch of IVS people who had been in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Fred was one of those. But there were he was I, Fred was IVS, you think? I think Fred was, but I'm, I'm not totally sure, but uh, he wasn't Peace Corps. I oh, I know. Yeah. Well, there's no Peace Corps in Southeast yeah, Asia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he he did a really wonderful book. He he went out and talked to kids and 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 had kids draw pictures and so uh, aerial attacks and bombings and it's things. Voices that, from the Plain of Jars. Yeah. Right yeah. about the heavy the heavy U.S. bombing of uh, of uh, Laos. Yeah. The secret bombing. Was yeah. It secret yeah. Bombing? yeah. 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 We weren't at war with Laos, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the sort of ironies of well, I don't know, one of the quirks of 
of political travel. We stayed at the hotel in Vientiane where, where the CIA pilots flying <laughs> stayed, right? You know, so both, both sides of the war were in the same, staying in the same place. <laughs> uh, anyway, he, he, a year or so after that, he came back and started, and I, I don't remember quite what the focus of the group was, but he started yeah. something in the 70s, mid-70s. This right. was, it, was, it was called um, Indochina Resource Center, or, you know. Whatever. No, it wasn't the Indochina Resource Center. It was a whole building on 18th Street. Yeah, which is now. Uh, and we, it had the Indochina Mobile Education Project. It had the um, Indochina Resource Center. It had the name of Fred's group. Why am I drawing a blank on this? But it was it was a center of activity for the anti-war yeah. movement. Yeah. And he was a frequent speaker at various things, and he wrote a lot of good stuff. He wrote, in fact, the director of IPS now, John Cavana, was an intern with Fred Brampton. Huh. That's how he ended up in Washington. He came as an intern to work oh. on anti-war stuff. Um, I'll remember the name of it in a minute. But. Yeah, so I, I try to get involved, and it's one of those things where you can't go home again, right? Yeah. You do you do something, you stop, and you try to go back, and it, 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 the, the, the ambiance, the mm -hmm. connections just aren't there. So I did that for a few months and... Um, Worked with Fred. Yeah, 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 and there didn't really seem to be a role, and so that was maybe one of the things I was doing before I decided I need to, well, I need to go back to school because I needed to get into the back into the workforce because I'd yeah. been sort of out of the workforce from 68 to 72 or 3 or well, even longer. Your son along that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so I I don't think I was very politically active during the 70s. That that's well, a you period. Went to Cuba for the US Well, but yeah, would that have that would have been 71, 70 71. Yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah, it was really a very large contingent of us that went to Cuba. A lot of people there. from DC went to Cuba too, didn't they? Trip later ones, but a lot seemed like a lot of people were going. Yeah. This was the CRV trip, I think. It was okay. Uh, and John McAuliffe was key in sort of organizing that. He knew. You, pick, you picked sugar, right? No, this was the year before. Oh, okay. Uh, and and I guess one of the things that happened after that, there was effort to recruit people to go down for the Zafra, the, yeah. the 10 million ton harvest. Yeah. I guess that. You went on that one. Hmm? You weren't on that one? No, oh, it was the year before. Okay, yeah. the year before. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you do in Cuba? Well, we went, we went out to the western end of the island and uh, did some agricultural activities, you know. Uh, I, it, I guess we did some agricultural activities for a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. We spent a couple weeks in Havana. Mm -hmm. uh, and th there were... There were lots... Uh, well, lots. There were some political discussions. I guess it was mostly, as with some of the, with the uh, part of the trips to Vietnam, which is to give Americans a picture of what was going on and to meet people and to ask questions and to share that information when you came back. Uh, the Cuba trip, obviously, one element was just to challenge the prohibition uh, of travel of travel to Cuba, uh, and. Um, Yeah, I don't know that very much ever followed on from the Cuba trip. Uh, I know post-Vietnam trip, I did a lot of speaking and the small groups and things, and then it was whatever got written in the CRV magazine. Uh, one of the specific things I remember, there was a rally in, uh, in Baltimore, uh, and I spoke at the rally. It was, I don't know whether you know the war plaza, area in front of City Hall. That was the site of the rally. There were a lot of people. Uh, and, and after I spoke, a portion of the audience went off and trashed buildings around in downtown Baltimore. Uh, Those were the days, right? People hmm? would do that. They heard something and they got mad and they went and smashed yeah, windows, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. That was the spirit. Yeah, it happened a lot. It doesn't seem... A lot of anger. Yeah, A lot yeah. of generalized anger. Yeah. And there was a lot of that. I mean, obviously Washington after oh, yeah. after King was assassinated. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, and and uh, you know, it's uh, some of the areas that ha had that happen to it. You know, showed the the results of that, the scars for years and years, decades. Well, yeah. Most of those, yeah, most of those areas, it's taken forty years to rebuild. Yeah. No. Right. With the changed population. Right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Do you remember? Um, do you remember after the uh, 
death of, uh, of Martin Luther King. A day, or so, a day or two after it started, they imposed a curfew and we couldn't go out after eight o'clock, was it? Nobody in Washington could go out unless they could prove they were on their way to work. Do you remember that? Having to stay in? Well, I remember they, 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 clo uh, they closed off part of, this, part of the area. I couldn't get back to my house on Q Street right, right. Uh, for yeah. a couple nights. Uh, there and was a tank at DuPont Circle. Do you remember that? I don't remember that. I've never seen a tank at DuPont Circle, but there it was. Did somebody have a picture of that? Right in front of the old people's drugstore. Right, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. It's the tank. Yeah. Well, that's kind of wild. One of the things that one of the things I guess I, I guess I was involved in, um, this this probably preceded working at the Civil Rights Commission and was maybe a credential that uh, Sue Oren, Sue Oren's the name. Uh, yeah. Sue Warren was involved, and we, this was a, sort of coincided with the riots after King, uh, did some demonstrating and, and uh, petitioning to get the troops out of the city, to let the, let the community people just express their anger and, and let the rioting go on, basically, I guess. Uh, and then there, there continued to be some acti activities. I don't I don't remember very specifically what, what happened. Again, that would be good something if I had any notes or... After the riots. Yeah, yeah, because that was an activity that continued for some time. I don't remember. Right. And in fact, there was even a group that had a name. Not the emergency, was it the emergency something? No, it wasn't that. Well, there was something with an emergency something or other, right. uh, and, and, or group like emergency that. Emergency committee on the transportation crisis. Well, that was, that was, uh, what's his name, Reggie Sam Booker Abbott? And Reggie Booker. And Reggie Booker, right, right. And, and that, was, that, that was a great local activity, was 70s? That, was that after, right after the riots, or was that later? I think it was later. Later, yes. I would, yeah, I would think. Right. Anyway. Because it's, uh, the, one of the things of trying to reconstruct the years is that, that an awful lot happened in a very few years. Oh, yeah. Uh, on top of and then through the through, I was the seventies, eighties, and nineties. Oh yeah, uh, I was running to catch up. Yeah, catch yeah. up with yourself. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you another question. Um, what do you feel? Um, how did your activism in the sixties and seventies, you think, uh, um, impacted your own personal life? Like, what 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 personal changes did it, did it bring to you, for good or for bad? I mean. I don't know. I had that. I might be prompted to say none, but uh, I mean, I, I guess it. I guess it. How you raised your son? Must have had some. Yeah, I mean, it was a pretty laid back kind of. Uh, you know, let him do as much as uh, watch, but but don't say no too soon, uh, and. Uh, Basically, I, and I guess this grew out of the spirit of the, of, the, of the 60s. Whatever he chose to do would be whatever made most sense, right? Uh, that, was, that was sort of mixed with, uh, you know, he should learn to play the violin and he should do all these other activities that he shouldn't have a spare moment, <laughs> right? You know, so right. it's a little bit of a contradiction, but, um, and uh, I guess, uh, by the by, the mid '70s, uh, this is part of the reason there's not that much political content for the next couple of decades. Was mm -hmm. that I, I, I got the degree, I got a job that was a you know a, a lots of out. Degree. I got a library. Yeah, I went back and got a library library degree, second master's, mm -hmm. uh, and got a job, part librarian, part researcher that I ended up basically keeping as it, even as it changed for 26 years. Uh, the company changed names, but the same group of people were running it all the time. Uh, so that took a lot of, yeah, and, and Okolo graduated from college, I guess, in 89. So from 71 to 89, that's mm -hmm. a pretty major focus. And but you also stayed active in a, in a sense. I mean, you're somebody whose ideas and persona doesn't seem to have changed you know, since then. Yeah, you, I don't you, think you so. You remained committed to certain ideas. and. Right now, you're doing calling, right, for the Democrats? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it's mostly anti Romney stuff. I mean, one's obviously disappointed with Obama. And oh, yeah. uh, so. uh, there's, a, there's a. David Sanger for the New York Times has a book, uh, 
conceal confront and, and conceal. Hmm? Confront and conceal. Confront and conceal. What's that about? Uh, it's about Obama's policies in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and, and fighting terrorists around the war. Uh -huh. uh, confront and conceal. Yes, yeah, confront, Obama's foreign policy in general. Confront yeah. and conceal. Yeah. Anyway, I, I've I've checked out, I've, I've been listening to the CD, uh, I'm waiting to borrow a copy of the book as well from the library, but it's very good, uh, very detailed uh, about the, the early evolution. I'm only into the second disc, so it's still the, the first year or two of, of his policies, and uh, yeah, it's, it's revealing, uh, what was that related to? <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, the disappointment in Obama. I mean, um, uh, we're, we're on the verge of doing a lot of dangerous things that, that people don't seem to be terribly aware. Uh, the other thing uh, is the whole notion of the war on drugs, which is ha having us fighting and killing people in a growing number of countries. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're now basing military people in Africa to deal with uh, you know, the fact that the cocaine trade has shifted and moved around and stuff. Uh, I've been, I, I have a project in mind, which is, the project is too strong a word. It's little more than a few slogans. Uh, but it seems to me, uh, you can erase this from the, from the video and the archive. It's not archive, it's, for, it's more fantasy land. But uh, I'll give you the four slogans. Legalize all drugs. Uh, cure, not kill, or n not guns or in prisons, cure, help people. Uh, tax users and, and sellers, and the deficit. The drug market is so enormous that you probably wouldn't have to tax, have any other tax than if you just tax, you know, cocaine and, and marijuana. But beyond marijuana, I mean, it's the legalized all, anyway. And, and, so many people who are in jail are in jail for, for petty uh, drug Small crimes. Uh, you know, enormous portion of the military gets uh, spent on that. I mean, you and know, police, the, the things. Policemen all around the world. Have, 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 anyway, yeah. uh, and, and so, I mean, maybe a little bit of a contradiction. I, I went down a couple times to the, the Occupy DC, down at Freedom Plaza, and I took a sign that said, Obama, join us. Uh, you know, he sort of danced. He didn't quite get there, uh, but there was at least a speech or two that supported. You know, the whole, uh, you know, and so, uh, there's just more disappointment. I mean, it's in, in spite of the few good things he did, it's basically not been a very good four years. And, right. and uh, even when he's done, even when he did well in the second debate, he didn't do a very good job answering some of Romney's charges. Right? Romney, of course, is a wacko. I mean, it'd just be a disaster if he were. If he and his people, okay. his people, right, were uh, speaking anyway. Of Occupy, if you could, if speaking of Occupy, um, if you could speak with Occupy Wall Street people today, the young people, or any of the uh, young activists who are doing social justice work, labor rights work, human rights work, what what's the main piece of advice you would give them? Patience. Patience. I mean, that's killed the that killed the the, the movement in the '60s. People just got impatient, right? Patience. They couldn't keep you couldn't people couldn't keep doing demonstrations. They had to move on to bombs, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. it, it, Patience. the whole notion that things take a very long time. Uh, and I guess I was I, I wasn't there often enough, but I, but it seemed to me that that. Uh, the most striking thing about, or one of the striking things about the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, was the great diversity of the population that participated. And, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of church, religious organization participation. It was a very different oh, yeah. religious community then than now. Uh, and um, even the demonstrations before the Iraq War started were very sizable and very diverse yeah. and, and didn't go on for very long. They sort of petered out. And I didn't get any sense of that from, from the couple times I went down to Freedom Plaza. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, it really just sort of very quickly became a bunch of hanger-ons who, I don't know, I, mean, very negative, made a, it, I had a very negative impression. And, and they, they seemed to do some good things. I got emails, but they always sort of conflicted with something I was doing. You know, focusing on somebody who has had their house foreclosed on. I mean, what a great target. I mean, you should be able to find lots of those and get a lot of good press. And so, anyway, uh, 
I generally found it a disappointing result, uh, obviously, and it doesn't seem to be that it's that it's gone on very effectively, and it hasn't sp spread out. Well, it seems something that the about spirit the spirit of it has spread, but it hasn't learned that lesson that we didn't learn either until very late. That you have to organize to actually get specific things done. It's not enough to object to something. Yeah, it, you've got to have a plan. With you know, I think you don't learn that until you have a couple of failures that way, where people are so enthusiastic, and then it all falls apart because nobody carries anything home. Yeah, well, and and uh, you know, I mean, left liberal forces have totally lost the uh, ability to capture the message that goes out. Right. I mean. Yeah. Uh, the fact that, that, I mean, there's no real popular uh, movement to address inequality. I mean, and, and people who are not very well off support inequality, right? Um, you know, by voting for very right-wing people in large portions of the country. Uh, one of the, one of the th things, I'm not sure this is a relevant uh, parallel with the United States, but in Nigeria there was not even before oil, there was a fair amount of low-level right. petty corruption and stuff. Right. And people were comfortable with it because the whole notion of an extended family, you know, I might not make it, but I have a relative who's made it and will share with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I will benefit if somebody in my extended family right. does well. Uh, that just doesn't hold true here. Right. I, I mean, the inequality, you're not going to, people who are not well off are not going to benefit uh, by sharing in the wealth of the people who have enormous no. Uh, concentrations, and that, and and I don't know that you know the the occupy the one percent the ninety nine percent, but I don't think that that went very far, went very far in influencing people's attitudes. I don't know. That's a, that's a hard one to understand. I think and to, okay. it's even harder to know how to deal with it because you're not going to get an Obama or or senators from Maryland or California to say anything about inequality, right? I mean, they're immediately attacked for racing, for class uh, warfare. yeah, class warfare. Uh, if they haven't waged it. Right. No, no. Okay, the last, the last uh, thought, the last question. Um, in your own life, you know, given the activities that you've done and how you've lived, what's the thing that you're the most happy with in your life, or the most proud of, or the most the thing that you're happiest that you've done? The thing or things? Oh, just continuing to do things. Yeah. And 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 uh, not reverted <laughs> or or become someone different. <laughs> and yeah. so it's happened to so many, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. You mean getting co-opted? Well, not even co well. Well, seeking to be co-opted, right? I mean, the uh, the commentary people. Commentary used to be a great liberal left-wing magazine, yeah, a wonderful people, right? And who's just sort of off the charts uh, and. Uh, yeah, so not, not having had that unfortunate experience, and, and I mean, uh, I mean I, I, again, uh, the, the failure of the 60s and 70s, the civil rights, the anti-war movement, was that it didn't, its failure was that it didn't continue, not anything that it did, or, and, yeah. and the spirit of that, that era was very different from the way things, the spirit now. It was very high. Yeah, to yeah. To me, what I remember about being here in the 60s, is that people were sort of well, literally and figuratively high a lot of the time, but really high on the uh, activities and success and being together and the. Oh yeah, like the there were group meetings. There were group meetings all the time, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Se what so were they called? Sensitivity meetings. sessions. And, uh, and, and I mean, not, there was that, but there was you were having meetings because you were doing something and you were making plans for something, and uh, yeah, it was a, a lot more interaction of peers and people doing. You, yeah. Other people doing similar things. And we all live together. We live well, in that, these group yeah. houses. We all live in these group houses. Also. There's always something going on. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, Jerry. We'll see what happens with the election. We're about three weeks or two weeks ahead of the yeah. election.